Okay, um, good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Glitches, What Glitches, an easy guide to teaching online, what you need to get started. Um, my name is Özlem Kabuklu and I am the sales representative for Cornelsen for the northern part of Germany. And um, today's webinar will be held by Britta Landermann, who is um, not only one of our authors, but also she uh, <laughs> is an advisor who helped us create um, one of our greatest books, um, which is called Basis for Business. And um, also Mrs. Landermann or Britta is also um, an English language trainer for, with experience for more than 20 years. I um, think that's it from me now. I'm going to hand over to you, Britta. Is that okay? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Aslam. Can you all hear me okay? Could you just quickly type into the chat whether, whether that's okay? Just thumbs up. Yes? Yes. Lots of yeses. Super. Very good. Okay. So a very, very warm welcome from me as well. It's so nice to see that we've got lots of guys from all over the place here with us today, from um, all over Germany. I even saw some people from somewhere else in Europe. Uh, well, that's really, really nice. And a few familiar names have popped up. Fantastic. That's really, really nice. I'm happy. So let's get started straight away. We only have 60 minutes to make the most of the time that we have here together. I'd like this to be a best practice exchange, so please make ample use of the chat. Type in tips and tricks that we can share so that we can benefit from each other's experiences and knowledge because I'm sure we've got lots of super guys, you out there, lots of experienced teachers. So please let us share our experiences and type into the chat whatever comes up during the, during the webinar. So let me show you what I've prepared for today. So we are going to talk about these points, if that's okay with you. That's our agenda. So five points all in all. And each point in the agenda will come with a small post-it, which will serve as our checklist. So the post-its might also be helpful should you want to scribble anything down or should you want to have a look at the video later. Um, these are the things that you might find useful in checking what to do when teaching online. So without further ado, ready, steady, go. Our first point. What technology to use? Um, as Azam already said, I have a little bit of experience in teaching, and I started teaching online a couple of years ago, um, not as formally as I do now, because then we still had on-site seminars, which at present, of course, most of us, I suppose, don't have. So the first thing I did was, being a German, I decided, oh, I need new uh, equipment to be well prepared. So I went into the local store and checked for computers was in for 10 minutes and then left totally frustrated because I couldn't understand a word of what was on the data sheets. So what I did instead was um, I, I checked with my 16-year-old niece, who was um, obviously better acquainted with the online world. And she helped me get the right computer. So what I'm saying is there is lots of stuff out there. and. Don't be afraid of just, you know, going to a supermarket, going into a tech shop and check what's, uh, what's available and ask the right people for help. This is going to be a work in progress forever. There is simply not the perfect equipment. It's changing all so fast and so quickly that we, it's just difficult to keep on track and that's absolutely okay. Just get help, ask around, and I'm sure there's people with lots of experience like us together today and you can type into the chat whether you find it useful or not. I can already see in the chat the audio is better now. Right. OK, very good. So what technology to use? Um, some of you might already teach online. Um, you might use your smartphones or maybe a netbook or a laptop or a desktop. Um, whether or how to decide what's good and what's not too good, that's the big question. Your students might only have smartphones, or your students might only have a laptop or an iPad. So it's a bit of a tricky way to find out which gadgets, which devices communicate best with each other. So how to decide what best to do. So I decided to do it the following way. I asked myself, is my computer appropriate to what I want to do? What do I mean by appropriate? How old is it? Um, 
is my processor large enough? When you go online and you start to work with online teaching platforms, you might find out that the processor that you have in your computer, should it be an older computer, and nowadays old means like, you know, three years, four years old, that your processor might not be able to handle all the data volume that the modern platforms expect a, uh, a computer to handle. So how to find out whether your computer processor is appropriate? First of all, you need to check where and what computer processor you have. It's usually, if you have a laptop, a sticker underneath, and you can check by just lifting your computer and find out what kind of computer processor you have. The computer processor is the brain of your computer, and if the brain is just too small to handle all the data that is needed nowadays, then you might end up with frozen pictures, with just you know uh, files and videos that don't upload accordingly or well enough for you to handle online. So make sure you go with, uh, with a good model. Oh, right, and some people already said, I, did I have computers? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So not everybody needs to have thousands of gadgets around, you know, just as long as you have one gadget that you feel okay working with. So check whether your computer is really up to date. Do you have a good system to run on? Do you still work with Windows XP? Maybe not a good idea, so check that you update. And the best way to find out whether that's okay or not is uh, to go online and to check with the platform that you're going to work with. And we're going to have a look how that works a little later. So we've checked our processor. We somehow figured out what is necessary. Then the question, do I need a big screen? When I started to teach online, I had a netbook, netbook this size, which was very handy because I could carry it with me everywhere. You know, all the on-site lessons, I had this small little thingy about this size, which was really super. Unfortunately, as soon as I started to teach online, I found out, oops, I need lots of partitions on my screen. Like when you look at your Adobe Connect screen, you probably have two partitions right now. You have the chat. You might have a little menu bars on the right and on the left. The smaller the screen, the more you need to squint to find out what is where and what is useful to use. So therefore, I've decided, hmm, I might want to go with a bigger screen. A bigger screen or monitor does not necessarily mean you need to invest in a new computer. You can also buy an external one and just, you know, log it on to your computer. So I now have this one that I'm looking into right now, which is a 17-inch, and I have a larger one standing right behind this one that I'm looking into now for things that I want to be really big on the screen when I need to read Excel sheets or stuff like that or technical drawings that students share with me. All this is not good on a smartphone, really. Although most gadgets and devices are now responsive, that is what you can see on your big screen will usually be compressed to be uh, uh, visible on the smartphone screen as well. But can you imagine reading a technical drawing on a smartphone? Doesn't work so well with me despite new reading glasses. So, so check for a screen that's large enough for you that you feel happy with looking at also for hours on end because online teaching is probably going to stay with us for a little while. So no squinting, look at a big screen. So screen large enough, then camera resolution. How many of you use an, off, an, <coughs> an external camera or an inbuilt camera? The camera I'm using is the inbuilt one. I don't have an external one. But you might find when you check with a simple free online platform <coughs> like Zoom, for example, that your camera resolution is kind of blurry. OK, some guys already write inbuilt. Uh, others might have decided, oh, you know, an external one that I just, you know, click onto the top of my laptop is a better choice. There's lots of stuff available. Um, I wouldn't go for the cheapest one, and I also wouldn't go for the most expensive ones because they're usually used by gamers. And since most of us, I suppose, are not, or the gamers of us probably already have a camera, uh, I would go with, I don't know, one of the trusted brands like Logitech or something like this. So. If, oh, somebody already writes you have an external one, okay, and you better quality, super. So that, that might be good advice. So if you feel like your picture is blurry and not really HD, <laughs> then you might want to go for an external camera. That's no which work. Cameras and computers nowadays understand each other more or less intuitively. So when you plug it in, it will, the computer will usually recognize, ah, new software, and will start the camera automatically. And it's also not a big invest. That should be OK. And then the big thing, microphone. The first time I started teaching online, I did not have a thingy like this. Oh, no, it's the other way around, like this. <laughs> I just spoke into my computer, which was OK as long as I had a one-to-one -one session. 
And as long as I was not in my kitchen, because in the kitchen, I had an incredible echo and a delay whenever I started speaking into the inbuilt microphone. You might find that when you teach a language, so communication, that your students benefit from having a microphone like a Bluetooth headset, like the one I'm wearing right now. Usually, the audio is clearer, is better to understand for your students, and also you're able to understand your students a lot better than when speaking into the inbuilt camera. At least that's my experience. When or if you decide to buy a headset, then um, I would um, decide for one which is cordless. Because the one that I decided for in the first place had a cord, uh, you know, to, um, to to plug it in in case it was running out of battery, and unfortunately the cord was not long enough, which I only realized when it crashed during a meeting. And I had to do the rest of the meeting like this because they, you know, the cord was not long enough to go into the computer. So I prefer to have a Bluetooth headset. Right? I can I can hear some of you say uh, the audio is uh, is not clear enough. So I'm going to move it a little bit further further down. I hope it's it's better now. So talking about glitches, sometimes something like, like this happens. And others say you can hear me well. Good. OK, so that may also have to do with the platform, not necessarily with the headset. The good thing about glitches is that you learn to stay calm. You know, you calm, stay calm and carry on, as they say. So I would recommend going for a Bluetooth headset instead of one with a cord just to be able to move around freely. Usually, Bluetooth headsets also allow you to walk out of the room and to still be able to hear what your students are talking about, which is good for creating break room, breakout room activities, for example. So there we go. We have our equipment. We have our maybe brand new computer. Who knows? We've checked our screen. Is it large enough? Uh, we've checked with uh, the processor. Is the processor you can it handle the data that we want it to handle? Is the camera resolution okay? Do we look okay? And does the microphone sound okay? At least to our ears. To be able to do that, better check with somebody else, not with yourself. You know, just do a test run with the microphone that you will be using. Super. So now we have our technology together. So far, so good. Time to check whether we really want to go teaching online. Do we really want to go? Um, can I pick your brains on that? I'd like to ask you a question. Is um, teaching online really the thing that we're going to do in the future? So I'm going to share a short survey with you. And I'd like you to please give me an idea of how many of you already teach online, of how many of you are going to start to teach online, are planning to teach online. Just Click where it is appropriate for you. Ah, lots of you already teach online. Mm -hmm. OK. Hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. 14.4. The fan saying teaching online is far less efficient than teaching on site. Hmm. We're going to talk about that as well. Half of you already teach online. Super. So I'm looking forward to sharing what your experiences are in the chat. Nobody says teaching online is a time cruncher. So you must be better organized than me, I suppose. So please let me know how you do that. <laughs> Some say it stresses them out because of technological glitches. That's very understandable. Mm -hmm. OK. Cool. So 50% of you already teach online. And um, many of you tend to think almost a a fourth tends to think teaching online is far less efficient than teaching on site. So I think that's worth another webinar to talk about why many of us feel that way. And we're going to get to that a little later when we're talking about teaching style. Super. So I'm going to take this away from you again. Right. So 
nowadays, of course, the decision whether we really want to do everything online or not has, is no longer in our hands because of the present situation. And uh, I'm going to share with you my ideas about what else to do to make teaching online a better experience. The B word, bandwidth. Oh my gosh, bandwidth is such a big thing. I experience so many glitches when doing one-to-one -one training with people and the people at the other end of the line don't have a bandwidth that is appropriate. So let's talk about what we can do at least on our end. I don't know whether you have ever checked your bandwidth. You probably all have a telecommunications contract and the contract says that you get that much data you know, through your lines and we all rely on that to be true or hope that that is true. Unfortunately, my experience is that that is not always the case. So what the telecommunications contracts usually say in Germany is that they can offer you a certain bandwidth, a certain bits per second that might get through your line, but that is not always the case. And I can already see some people changing experience in the chat, saying that, yes, technology is a very a super important aspect, but not the only one. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, technology is not the only thing that you need to know. And bandwidth is not the only thing that makes you a good teacher. I absolutely agree, agree to that. However, a, a low bandwidth can crash any platform and any, any you know, good preparation and all, all the, you know, the effort that you've put into your preparation. If the bandwidth is not OK and the, the, your students can't see your video, can't see the picture, the data, the files that you want to share, then there is no online teaching. So what to do about bandwidth? I think for those of you getting started in online teaching, it's important to check what is your real, your actual bandwidth before you start teaching. I use, for example, this website. I don't know whether you guys have any experience with any other ones, so please share with us if there is you know, any other speed test websites that you find reliable. I've used this one, or these two. And at present, so I checked before uh, we, uh, we decided to do this webinar this morning, so my download bandwidth is 16.3 and my upload 51.8 Mbps per second. Now, what does that tell you? Well, you say, okay, that's Mbps, so what does that tell me? Hmm. How to find out whether that is sufficient or not? Trial and error is one way, which happened to me a lot, I have to admit. And I had no idea why pictures kept freezing and I couldn't upload my, my videos or they, they, they uploaded super slowly. So what I did is I checked with the platforms I work with and checked with their requirement pages. What kind of bandwidth do they require for their software to work well either via my browser or via a web application? I can only recommend to really do that because the information that you might get from your telecommunications company might not be 100% reliable or might not reflect the actual situation you might find yourself in. So I checked with a couple of websites to find out what is my bandwidth, and they gave me a lot of information about upload and download and, and lots of pings, jings, and stuff like that, and I, frankly speaking, did not exactly know the difference between upload and download, so I thought, hmm, my download rate sounds good, so okay, I'll go with that until I find out that my picture, my picture kept on freezing because I had an incredibly low upload rate in my office. Upload is important to reflect what you want to show to your students. Download is what you get from the net. So if your download rate is super, you can go screaming. You might want you know, to watch uh, uh, videos or, or movies with your students from a streaming service, no problem. But if you are uploading your own videos or your face to the screen, then your upload should be well enough to reflect that. So make sure it's not just your download, but also your upload. And the upload rate is sometimes something that telecommunications companies don't focus on so much because they well, the usually perception is that we're all interested in download because of streaming services and that sort of thing. But upload is important because it's you. You're uploading yourself, you know, to your students. So useful to build more flexibility and to check what your real upload and download rate is. So as I said today, my download rate today is 16.3 uh, and my upload 51.8. And that is usually enough to do training with around about 10 people. So I sometimes have 10 people on the screen with me, all participating via video, me showing files and data and having my video on the screen, and that works. OK, so, so far so good. So we've checked our bandwidth. Very good. Bandwidth itself is the information that goes through your lines, through your telecommunication lines. That, that of course, needs to be shared. So 
if you're doing a webinar or doing some online training and you'll have three teenagers watching, uh, I don't know, binge watching some of their favorite series at the same time, then you might find, oops, the bandwidth gets shared among four people and there may not be left enough for you. So therefore, I would recommend that you really check when you go online and that in the worst of all cases, those three teenagers will have to watch their series a little later. Um, bandwidth is shared in households depending on how many lines, of course, you have. But generally speaking, it's shared upon everybody who goes online. And if you can, you might even consider going online with a cable, with a LAN cable and not Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is usually not that reliable, not as reliable as a LAN cable. So if you can, just plug it in, you know. And if you don't want to, then make sure your Wi-Fi is stable enough. So make sure there are not too many rooms between your Wi-Fi. If you have a big house, you might not want to do your webinar in the cellar just because it's quieter there. If your Wi-Fi, your router is up in the living room. So do a few test runs. You know, spare, spare yourself the glitches that, that I had. <laughs> because I did my first webinar in the Winter Garden because I thought the light was so nice. Unfortunately, nobody could hear me because I had a terrible echo and the Wi-Fi connection was not that good. So. Let me share with you, don't do that. Check out beforehand. Make sure you're close to your router or if you can use a LAN cable. That's always the, uh, the safer option. Okay, next. Uh, next thing, how to find out how much I really need, how much data do I really need to, to how much volume, you know, to go, to go through my cables. Um, I checked with the platforms I work with because they usually have good system requirement pages. So go online, check with the platform you want to work with, and rely on the information that they give you there. And almost all of them do that. So they tell you which processor is useful, what bandwidth do you need, um, when are peak times, you know, when is good to use them, when are they, may they themselves be a little overloaded because of all the guys doing online training. So go to the websites, check beforehand. Uh, save yourself, you know, the, the time to find out, oh, I need to interrupt the training because the connection is not good or I can't see my student or for whatever other reason. Things like that just happen. So good preparation is half the battle won. Okay, so now we're set. We're having our new equipment, maybe. We're having a, a new headset. We know our bandwidth. We're, we've sent all our kids outside, you know. Nobody's been watching anymore. Super. Okay, so now we will try to get into our first training. Very good. Now, what platform with? This is really, oh my gosh, this is Pandora's box. There are so many platforms available. So I don't know what you guys work with, so please give us recommendations because there is so, so much available. Um, I've just listed the ones that I've been working with recently, but I'm sure there's a lot, a lot more to add. So these are the ones I'm working with at present. And I hope that you guys will be able to, you know, to give us a wealth of more information in the chat right now. So there is Zoom, there's Blue Jeans, there's Google Hangouts, Skype, Skype for Business, uh, which is now Microsoft Teams. EduDip, which some of you, uh, should you people also work for VHS, you might find that some of the VHS use EduDip. Google Classroom, there's still Moodle around um, from the old days. MS Teams, mm -hmm. yes, and I can, I can see some people write Zoom, Zoom free sessions, yes. Mm -hmm. Zoom and Microsoft Teams, VHS also uses Zoom, this is what some of the people say, Adobe Connect, mm, okay, super. The good thing about most of the, ah, Moodle Mahara. I, I didn't, somebody's writing here Moodle in the chat. Uh, uh, she uses Moodle Mahara. I, I'm not aware of Mahara. Web, ah, WebEx, yeah, right. That's what lots of companies also use. Super, okay. So whatever you decide to use, you will probably find out that a lot is now available for free. So if, if there is a good thing about the situation is that lots of platforms now decide for either educational institutions or also for teachers and freelancers, solo entrepreneurs to offer their services more or less for free. So at least that's a good thing. And Zoom does that, for example. You may have heard about data protection issues, which some of these platforms undoubtedly do have. So you may want to check before you start investing in a subscription model or investing time into finding out how Zoom works, whether your client should you work with in corporate clients, whether your client is happy with that too. With some clients, at least some of my clients say, no, we don't work with Zoom. We're not happy with their data protection policy. So we only work with MS Teams, for example. So 
make sure you don't prepare for something, you know, and invest time, then find out, oh my gosh, my client is not, um, is not willing or is not, um, uh, yeah, is not willing or prepared to use the platform I'm happy with. Go to meeting. Ah, yeah. Just popped up in the chat. That's another one I'm going to use with uh, our auditor next week. So there's a wealth of stuff around. Um, you will probably find out as soon as you start with one, they're pretty similar. You know, you, you, I'm sure you get the hang of it. Um, MS Teams is one that most companies use, so that might be one that you that might be a good idea to get to get acquainted with. Um, Zoom and Blue Jeans um, is something that lots of people also use for their private, you know, video communication. Um, that's good because um, it's easy to handle also from the student side. So, how does what does my checklist look like for platforms? My checklist looks like this. So, what I found important. <coughs> is I definitely want a platform with a good video option. Because I cannot imagine doing training without video anymore. When I started doing training online, we had to do it without video because bandwidth was really not, was really not good. And we only had the video on whenever somebody said something. They quickly switched their video on so we could see and then they switched their video off again. I don't find that appropriate anymore. So I checked for a platform with a good video option, preferably with an HD video with really good video quality. And then super, super important, I want a user-friendly invite. I want to send out an invite to many of my students, you know, in a bulk. I, I want my students just to click on one invite link. I don't want them, you know, to having to read lots of data protection stuff, uh, uh, struggling through various link systems. I want an easy invite that doesn't frustrate students before they even started class. And I think most of the platforms I've listed here do that. By user-friendly, I mean you should be able to send a simple invite in an email text to your students, and they should be able to click on a link, and then they should be able to get into your meeting, preferably with a password. But nothing more should be, um, should be necessary. And the third point, oh my gosh, let me share with you why the third point was really important for me. My first meeting, I started with Zoom because I found Zoom really easy to handle, um, almost self-explanatory, and I had prepared everything uh, for four students of mine, sent out an invite, and unfortunately, the students were not aware of the fact that their company does not allow them to download anything on their computers as long as they're in home office. They don't have the administrative rights. So they were not allowed to download the web app, and they had problems uh, attending the meeting via their browser. So everything I had prepared went more or less well. I wouldn't say down the drains, but we had to set it up on a different system. And uh, we had to get onto MS Teams because we had this issue with the participants not having the administrative rights to do anything on their computers at home. And that is the case with a lot of people who do in-company home office. Who, who do, sorry, who do home office and who are not in company at the moment. So make sure that the platform that you send invites for is something that they're allowed to use on their computer. Sometimes that is not the case. So what I prefer is browser-based attendance if possible. Zoom, for example, does that. It sends out two links. So one is the participation through a, um, a web um, a app that you can download onto your computer, and the other is browser-based which is good. You have the option, so to say. Then you might want to find out, is, the limit, is there a limited meeting time? Zoom had limited meeting time for a certain period of time. Uh, time. Now, I think it's free for, for everybody, uh, but you might want to check out so as not to, uh, to uh, you know, get kicked out after 45 minutes just because the platform decides, oops, free time is over, <laughs> and the remaining 45 minutes, you'll have to, you know, send out another invite and so on and so forth. Oh, all these glitches. Well, check whether there is limited meeting time. Many have a subscription-based model. So why not check out a platform just for a month? There is no need you know, to go for the annual subscription if you are not 100% sure whether that is what you really want. So you can have a free trial version. You know, Nobody of your students will see that as a free trial version. So just check it out, use them as guinea pigs, and try whether the platform works well for you. And go, don't go for the annual model straight away. Very important. Is there a screen sharing mode? 
screen sharing is super important because otherwise students will not be able to see what you've prepared. So you cannot just hold a paper into the camera. You need a good screen sharing system that enables you to share, to interactively share what you've prepared. And that also includes, preferably, your students being able to work on what you've prepared. So not just you showing pictures, so to say, but students also working with the pictures or the data or the statistics or the exercises that you've prepared in files. So screen sharing mode, uh, an interactive screen sharing mode, is something that I would definitely expect a good platform to have. Somebody's just sharing the demo is really good. Yes, I, I agree to that. That's something that a colleague uh, recommended to me. Super, thanks for sharing. That's really good. Some of my colleagues who teach, for example, English for chemistry or, um, I don't know, co uh, commercial math and that sort of thing, they said they like an interactive whiteboard. An interactive whiteboard is something that Zoom, for example, also offers. Not that I'm recommending Zoom in any way, just as an example. Uh, interactive whiteboard is something that allows you to draw on the screen. So you can draw graphs and lines and circles and arrows and can highlight things. You know, it's a rather playful, intuitive way of handling it as if you really wrote on, on a whiteboard in, in your class. And that is really useful, especially if you don't want, you know, a Word document where you have to check for all sorts of, I don't know, characters and digits that you need to fill in because chemical formulas can sometimes be difficult to type, and many platforms offer that. So that is a useful thing to look for, interactive whiteboards. Plus, you should be able to upload files, definitely. I like it to upload files into the chat, for example. So that saves me from sending links to students via email. I just upload them into the chat, and the, the students download whatever you know I want. I, I invite them to download on the internet, and that's that. And no more exchange is possible. Very useful. So make sure you can upload things into the chat or into any other place on the platform for your students to get them to get this information straight away. Okay, so. I've now made you know, a simple list, or simple list, but a list <laughs> to decide what, what I would expect a good platform to have. The question is, do you also need an LMS? An LMS is a learning management system. A learning management system is basically a service that allows you to document and to archive what you've done and what you're planning to do with your students online. Before I started to teach online, I had everything on paper. I had folders, I had things that I stashed away in my desk, and then I started to teach online. And I thought, oh, good, cool. I don't need all this paper stuff anymore. Let's go for paper-free office, you know, save the environment, okay? I did that and found out that I was unable to find anything. It was just horrible. I, I had big problems finding the super video that I thought I had found for this or that group last Monday. And I thought, oh my gosh, where is that? I put it into the lizard session somewhere and I can't find it anymore. It was a real nightmare, to be honest. I was not well organized online until I did some training, a short you know, learning nugget training uh, with uh, somebody online who said, okay, you need to get yourself organized. Online organization, I find myself a lot of time, and I've decided for two learning management systems. One is Google Classroom, and the other is another one that we use at our company. It's a private one that tech company set up for us, where we can archive and document stuff class-related. So if you have a recommendation for a good LMS where you'd say, yeah, I store all my stuff there. It's, I've got folders. I've got a super organized archive. I can you know, find everything there. My students have access to that. Please share. I'd be very happy to change, you know, my system. It's still far from perfect. So if you have anything to share, please do. Moodle, of course, you can also use as an, as an online archive. Ah, VZQ, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's something that somebody's just recommended, super. Mm -hmm. Elias, OK, that's, that's new to me. So I've never heard that one. So I'm going to scribble that down. So I can check it out later. So that's I-L-I-A-S. Super, thanks for sharing. Link, OK. Link, OK. Mm -hmm. OK, Elias, um, I, Elias, Elias, I-L-I-S, uh, used by many universities, OK. Yeah, and Moodle. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have Moodle um, for, for our company. However, I, find, I tend to find Moodle a bit bulky. Um, you know, with regard to access, and uh, yeah, 
I, I don't find it that much up to date anymore. Although as a as a archiving system, of course, it's it's very handy, and we still use it. We still use it. Cool. So please please keep on sharing. That's really very that's really helpful. Super. So as I said, I also use Google Classroom uh, to share with my students. I use my I use my G Drive, uh, so Google Drive, which is basically cloud based. It's not basically cloud, but it is cloud based, um, which is very handy. However, cloud based obviously you know sounds nice, but means that all the information that you store there goes to some server farm somewhere in the world, um, and not all of my clients are happy with that. According to the new European Data Protection System, you will have to make sure officially that client names, for example, don't pop up in any G Drive or any LMS without knowledge of your client. So be careful with what you store and save there. If you work on contracts or help, help students um, can, you, can you still hear me? Hmm. Okay. I just talking about glitches. I um I just had a little a little hang up. My computer said it it wanted a rest. Okay. So, um so when you thank you thanks for all the yeses. <laughs> um when you uh decide to use Google for example Google your G Drive as um, as an LMS uh, make sure your clients are happy with that. So should you be translating contracts for your clients or use technical drawings with your clients' names on it or the names of gadgets machines or that sort of thing. Make sure you either blotch that or you sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, with your with your clients before you do that. Um, everything that goes out in the cloud goes out into you know somewhere, and nobody actually really knows where. So I I work for example for um, a lawyer's office, and they definitely I th I think they probably kick me out, you know, if I if I even recommended using my G Drive, you know, as, as an archiving system. So make sure with your clients before you start setting up a, a very nicely organized system, then finding out that you will not be allowed to make it available to your to your students. Moodle is a better choice in that case. Hey. So now we should be said, okay, we have our technology, we've checked our bandwidth, so we are happy with our internet, we know what platform to work with, we've decided what LMS maybe to start with, we probably sent a checklist to our clients asking them, will you be allowed to use Zoom or are you already working with Teams, uh, would you be happy with EduDip or any other learning platform, we got the okay from the client, okay, ready to start. However, before starting. Will this be like um, it used to be before when we were still all teaching on site? Or will we have to change when teaching online? Um, can I pick your brains on one more thing before we di we'll dive into, into this topic? Um, i like to ask you a question about your experience with your students. In this case, you're, uh, you should be allowed to click on more than one of these questions. And I'd like to know from you what your students think about going online. Oh my gosh, they prefer having us on site, obviously. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really, really clear outcome. I should, I should say. By now, eighty. Oh my gosh! Now, eighty point four percent of you are saying they prefer to have you on site, right? Okay. Yeah, that's. To be honest, that's something that also lots of my students say. Um, we had, we had to go online for obvious reasons. Um, however, there's also a couple of students who said, well, actually, you know, I prefer online, like uh, some of you guys are saying in the chat now, um, because it saves me travel time. Um, I'm, you know, out there very often on business trips, 
and I'm, I'm almost never able to participate on a regular basis in on-site training, and I prefer the flexibility of you know, being able to go online to join the training from my hotel room, from, my, from the conference center I'm in, from the client side or wherever. So online has a certain flexibility that maybe regular appointments on site don't have. However, the question why so many students still, still say, and also teachers, I suppose, being on site is actually nicer, I think, has something to do with the fact that I'm now looking at a little green light here in my camera, uh, light right next to my camera, and you're probably looking at a per uh, the face of a person talking into a screen from Steinhagen <laughs> um, in Germany, uh, and you don't see my body language. I can see whether you're smiling or whether you're frowning. Uh, my only way of communication is looking at what you're writing uh, into the chat. Now, if, you, if your bandwidth and your platform is good enough to really allow you to have, let's say, 10 students online, at least you'll be seeing their faces. But this reading the air, you know, this being in a room together, seeing whether somebody's fidgeting, looking at their watch, or maybe somebody's muting themselves, not because they, I don't know, they don't want to be heard through their microphones, but because they're bored and going for coffee. All this, you know, is happening online, and it seems to be out of our control. So empathy, as somebody's just writing here in the chat, is, yeah, is really, really important. And I agree with that 100%. And that's harder online. So this is why I was saying, make sure you have a good video connection to your students, because that's the only thing you'll be able to see as long as you don't have stand-up meetings, which you can also have, theoretically speaking. So make sure at least you got good video to, to show empathy, to see what your students are doing. Are they frowning? Are they looking out of the window? Are they, you know, can you see they're actually writing or can you hear they're typing something while you're being in, in class with them together? So all this needs to be somehow made up for. This, this lack of being able to read the air of being in a room together. And that's tricky. Yeah. It's, it's different. It's possible, as some of you say in the chat, but it's, it's different. Yeah, it's definitely different. So what needs to change in my experience? Did I have to change my teaching style? Definitely. Definitely, yes. If you knew me in class, you probably know I, I seldom sit. I walk around the room a lot. I'm, I'm a really kind of, some people would li say lively, some people would say hectic, hectic kind of co-learner or teacher or learning facilitator. I love being in the room and I love moving my hands around. All this is not possible when teaching online because it looks really weird when I do that or when I just walk out of the camera or that sort of thing. So I had to change my way of teaching, definitely. But not only in, the, in that I behave differently, I also had to think about other things, like, for example, where am I right now in the teaching world? What kind of things are helpful for me that I already know from teaching on site that I can carry over into the online world? What kind of experiences have I made? What kind of qualifications might I need? Certificates, that sort of thing. Micro-learning, learning nuggets. So I checked where, uh, where I was a couple of years ago, when I and I started with planning time. My planning time exploded when I started to go online. I don't know why, but the internet is just, you know, so, so full of information and there is such a lot of supplementary material to be got to what we have from the publishing companies that um, I find myself, I found myself preparing a lot longer than before. Okay, that was easy, you know, to limit by just saying, okay, I allow myself that and that much time together with the book I'm using to prepare for one lesson. Okay. That was done. But then I found out, hmm, what I found needs to be um, edited in some way, to be presentable on screen. You cannot just, you know, copy, which, I mean, officially we shouldn't have done before anyway, but you cannot just hold a thing into the camera. It needs, it needs to be prepared to look nice, to share on screen. That takes time. You need to prepare PowerPoints, or you need to get yourself organized with an Unterricht manager from a publishing company. So my planning time at the beginning increased, and I had to really limit and restrict myself. Otherwise, I would have drowned in all the information that was available. The planning time at the beginning was an issue. So how did I try to limit that? Um, I started using an LMS. 
I started with an NOS right from the beginning after I found that I could not rely on me getting to the material that I used last that I used last week because it was somewhere in my computer or it was out on some cloud somewhere. So I started with an LMS online learning uh, with a learning management system to really limit the my the time that I spent online hunting for material and preparing for students. Also I found out that because we're so used to being online and getting immediate responses to the clicks that we put online. We're all Amazonized in a way that also my students expected immediate response from me. So if I uploaded something or said, I'm going to send you a link, I'm, I, I would like to invite you to do this or that, that it would not suffice anymore to say, I'll bring it along next week or I'm going to send you an email or something like this. No, they wanted it either in the chat or they wanted it uploaded immediately to their LMS to be accessible and uh, they wanted immediate feedback if they had a question about this. So my experience is that I had to, to be online and available longer and more often. So I had students getting in touch via LinkedIn. I had students sending messages into the forum and Moodle. I had other students you know, asking for a quick Zoom invite uh, to discuss something with, uh, with me to avoid drowning in all this online presence, I decided, OK, I need fixed times. I need time for myself to prepare and to get grounded again. And I need time uh, that I allow students to spend with me. And uh, my solution to all this was that I sent them a response whenever they send something. But my response can also be, thanks for your, uh, for your inquiry or for your query. I'll get back to you tomorrow by 2 o'clock or something like this. So this pressure to always be available, to immediately respond to, respond to what they do, I found that, that I had to restrict that just you know, to, to reduce planning time and to, to stay grounded. Yes. What else changed? Documentation. Um, I stopped uh, uploading links and files just because I thought, oh, that might be useful, and that might be useful. And this is something I could use for the class on Monday or something like this. That had me end up in a undoubtedly very nice archive, which I never got back to. So what I now do is I only upload and document things that I really, really use for students. And the rest goes out, because the internet is a huge place. And I found that stuff from publishing companies um, very often helped me to stay more grounded than when just just going online and hunting for uh, supplementary material. Although I love TED Talks and I love lots of the YouTube channels, science channels that are around there. Very helpful stuff, but not everything can be done all the time. And there's new stuff every week and every other day. So documentation, very important. How to keep students motivated? So we've now been talking for around about 50 minutes. I've been talking into my screen. You've been listening. You've been sharing information. You've taken part in surveys. And if you had a microphone and if I could see who you were, then we would, of course, even be able to interact more spontaneously and more interactively. Um, all this, of course, should, should definitely be part of your online teaching, I think. To just talk into a screen for 90 minutes will, oh gosh, it will, yeah, you will have your students drop off their chairs. Um, so what you would want to have is something like breakout rooms allow students to collaborate, uh, walk away from the screen, um, uh, invite them to do tasks, to collaborate also online. So I often set up groups, even though people are not in the same room. I set up groups and said, you guys could work together on this or that question. We'll be back in three minutes and, you know, ex and, and um, exchange the, the, the findings. Uh, go on a web quest, you know, to find out more information. Give them the feeling they're in control. They can collaborate. They can actively do something while being online. It should definitely not be just looking into a screen or looking at a piece of a, a document or a piece of paper or, or a book that they have on their knees. There's so much more you can do. You can use pictures and videos. You can allow them to share information. You can organize breakout rooms. That is, you can make them collaborate in a breakout room on a platform, work together, come back, do a mini presentation. All this is possible technologically speaking, like what you did when you were still teaching on site. And the, the, the more collaboration, the more interaction, the, merry, uh, the better. <laughs> the merrier too, the better. And finally, let's talk about us as teachers. Oh yes, somebody's just saying bright our sessions can be great. Hmm. Yeah, of course, that um, 
yeah, that, that, that needs to be organized. I agree, yes. Um, my experience is best to organize breakout sessions during the session itself. Uh, that is, I, I organize people to work together. I invite them to work together in small teams uh, in a breakout session, and then we'll simply close class for 10 minutes or whatever, and then they all come back and um, yeah, present their findings or start a discussion or whatever the task was. Softwares that allow breakout rooms, for example, is um, Zoom again allows a breakout room if you have the pro version. Yeah, somebody's already typing that into the chat. So if you have anything else to help with that inqu uh, uh, inquiry, you know, which software allows breakout rooms and also in an easy way, please share. Adobe Connect also, super. Mm -hmm. If you find all of this a bit overwhelming, and to be honest, at the beginning I did, I wasn't sure that that was for me. Now I'm absolutely sure it is. I really like it now. But I wasn't at the beginning. I decided, oh gosh, I need some resilience training. I need to get used to the fact that the platform that I found three months ago and that I'm happy to work with might either close down, might not be used by the client, uh, might not be available to my students, and I therefore had to work with another platform, and another, and another, and another. And my experience is, believe you me, it's going to be like this for a long time. It's a work in progress, and glitches, glitches will be there all the time. Glitches is something that your students can handle as long as you tell them what's going on and how you're handling them. Nobody expects you to be perfect on screen. Nobody expects you to have the super platform or the super presentation. <clears throat> Everybody's happy with you saying, well, I need to figure that out. Hang on a sec, you know, I'll switch off my screen or whatever. Everybody's happy with that because it's all work in progress. And if you speak to people, employees of companies, and ask them, How's your work with MS Teams? You wait for their replies. You hear lots of people saying, oh my gosh, you know, it's so complicated and I didn't get the information I needed or uh, MS Teams meeting didn't work, the audio was bad or whatever. Things like that just happen. So the only way to react, to bounce back, is to become resilient and to go for some resilience training. Resilience is not the only thing if you feel, hmm, okay, I probably need some further education on that. I want some university people to tell me about the pedagogics or the learning psychology behind online training. There is help available. You could, for example, go of course to the publishing companies because they, uh, they, pub they, they publish a lot of webinars, so colleagues talking to colleagues, so to say, best practice exchange. But there, is also, there are also huge um, online platforms which offer further uh, education. One of the largest worldwide is Coursera.org. I don't know whether you've heard about this before, whether anybody's made good or bad experience with Coursera. Um, I used some training on that platform myself. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge global platform which uh, collaborates with lots of universities as well. Um, so I did some education on online training with the University of Illinois, which I found very, very useful. Uh, lots of stuff is almost for free as long as you don't want to do or have a big certificate or uh, join a, a real uh, study groups or, or that sort of thing. All right, and some people are already writing what kind of education they've already used, super. Mm -hmm. You can also go to LinkedIn Learning, of course, and check, check out further education there. So what I'm saying is you don't necessarily need to invest thousands of, of bucks, you know, on getting further info, uh, info, um, uh, education. Usually nowadays it's learning nuggets or micro-learning is what does the trick. So go, go to different platforms, check out what is good for you, and then try to figure out how that can be you know, put into practice in the guides that you'll be working with online. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily tra it, it need or take a, a two-year training uh, um, at, at a university to teach online. Uh, education, a lot of education and information is available out there, and good, in, good information and trustworthy information as well. So I can recommend those two platforms, for example, to go with. However, there's, of course, also the University in Magdeburg, which offers a very good training. Um, I'm not saying universities are bad. I'm just saying one can look for micro-learning and learning nuggets instead of starting a big thing like a year and a half training. Because in the end, everything we, need to, we learn needs to be applicable now, because now is the situation in which we need online training, right? OK. So we've educated ourselves, we've got our technology, we've got our bandwidth, we know which platform to work with. So what can the publishing companies offer us? 
of course, Cornelsen's um, well aware of the fact that most of us are now in home office teaching from home, and therefore there is material available there as well. Um, I can speak, for example, for the, the books I've been working with, like Basis for Business or Business English for Beginners is it's, it's the books I'm, uh, I've been using now for a couple of weeks. Um, and for these books, you'll find an Unterrichtsmanager. The course books that I've just mentioned um, can now be accessed for free as ebooks over a period of 100 days. So what you can do is, if you have the book and you open the book, you'll find a code in the book. You can share this code with your students, and then you can all go onto Skook. Skook is the publishing company's own um, uh, learning management and uh, uh, EPUB website. You can go to Skook, and you can share the ebook there for free for a period of 100 days. So that is something really, really helpful in case your students either don't have the book or left it in the company or whatever, or for what reason ever. So you can, ha you can have it on the screen. And not only can you have an EPUB on the screen, you can also have an interactive, uh, interactive version of the book on the screen. I'm, I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to share this, my screen with you. And my screen will show you what this Unterricht Manager looks like. So can you are you now able to see to see my screen? Could you quickly type into the chat whether you can see? Oops, you can not see it. Okay. So I'm gonna Some said yes, some said no. Talking about glitches. <laughs> yes, 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 now, yes, now, yes. OK, so now you should be able to see my screen. OK, so if you go onto full screen mode, uh, then you should be you should be able to see it even better. And now, so what you can see here is the Unterrichtsmanager uh, of, in this case, uh, Basis for Business uh, A2. Uh, what is good about it is that it's not just an EPUB; it's an interactive version of the EPUB. The cool thing about it is that if you click, for example, on one of the audios that are here in the book, like here it's a telephone conversation, for example, between two people, it's, a, it's a, a whole unit about telephoning, then you'll be able to play the track to your students on your learning platform, which is really useful because no more uploading MP3 or MP4 you know, files to your, or exchanging it via email with your students or uploading them to your, to your computer and then sharing computer audio and so on and so forth. If you just open your Unterricht Manager and share the computer audio, your students will be able to hear what you play to them. And you'll be able to show them videos um, and all the audios in the book um, using the Unterricht Manager, which is really, really helpful. Plus, there is a, um, a small learning management section on the left-hand side as well, where you can type in notes um, and uh, things, for example, that you, that you want to either memorize yourself or that you want to remind your students of. So all your lesson preparation can go into this Unterricht Manager. And should worst come to worst, and should your bandwidth not allow for you to use this, you can also download it for offline use, which is really cool. You can also highlight stuff. So you can use, you know, something like this and highlight or underline things or draw things, um, whichever way you prefer or like. So it's really, it's really interactive and it's really, really useful. Far better than having the students, you know, listen to something at their end of the screen and you listening to something at your end of the screen. So, so I find this useful. And I'm using the Unterricht Manager with exactly this book. This includes also videos, um, audios, and anything that comes with, with the book. The Unterricht Manager is not for free. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it's definitely worth because it saves you a hell of a lot of preparation time.
So that is something I would really, really recommend uh, doing if you want to go on working with the book. Supplementary material is available on the Cronism website, which you can easily upload you know, to the screen and then do a Bildschirmfreigabe and share with your students. The Unterrichtsmanager is there to share audio and video material interactively with your students. So really, really helpful. At least I find it very helpful. Okay. So right, there we go. OK. So I hope I've shared a lot of the material that I found useful um, and uh, that um, I've been using so far. Uh, if you oops, go I'll share my screen with you again. So if you find that there is anything else that you need that you would be interested in having online, for example, it would be super. Um, if you can, uh, if you could put that into the chat, because it's always useful for us to know uh, what you need and what would be good for you to have. So, if there is anything else also that has to do with the books that we are presenting, please let us know, and we'll try to get as much stuff online as is good for you. So, thank you for being online with us today. It's been a pleasure being allowed to pick your brains and to learn about all the experiences you've made so far. So I'm, I'm sure we'll all get better with this, and bandwidth permitted, we'll all be teaching online happily ever from now on. So thank you very much. <laughs>